in the Air Force, then kind of, you know, did my own life, then helped my dad in the evenings and weekends. And uh, while I was here, he found out he had stage four lung cancer. A stick fell out of the tree. He picked it up and put it on a pile. And one day I was out doing the same thing and I noticed there's, there's earthworms in this. He went to Swoop, Virginia and saw Joel Solitan at the Polyface Farm. The conventional way, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a losing game. My, my grandfather said, never play the other man's game. I don't want to be wrong and they don't want to change. This is the way I've always done it. I think when you start going down the path that I go down, those folks who disagree with you, they just, they, they avoid you. There's like seven or eight farms that share the freight mm -hmm. on feed for their farms coming this way. Those animals having a really great life out on pasture where they were intended to be and regenerating the soil and the process of what they do every day and they have one bad day. In the Air Force, then kind of, you know, did my own life. You know, my uh, stepmom passed away in 91, okay. August of 91. My dad, we were, we were living in North Carolina. I was in the Air National Guard by part-time, and then uh, I was director of global sourcing, was traveling all over the world. Wow. Western North Carolina, beautiful part. We got lots of, lots of great friends, a lot of good memories there. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, we were looking to come back home our parents were getting older and you know we knew that there was going to be needs there 2008 december 2008 my uh, state headquarters was going through a training at camp shelby to okay. send their brigade to afghanistan so i kind of hitched a ride on that and uh came down worked at camp shelby during the day and then helped my dad in the evenings and weekends and, and what have you on the farm on the farm okay uh he was very limited in what he could do at the time yeah and uh, while I was here he found out he had stage four lung cancer and then oh. in February he uh, passed away Wow so I inherited a good bit of what you see but we've also in 2010 we cleared about 75 acres uh, in 2012 we cleared another 35 Wow. in 15 I bought uh, 52 acres adjoining okay and then in uh, the fall of 2018, I bought 160 acres. So how much total do you have now? Just over 500. Wow, and you're capitalizing all of that in some capacity. There's a really good book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He teaches you a lot about, you know, that most people spend all of their income, their disposable income, on stuff that never materializes, have value, it does uh -huh. not generate any income for them or nothing. I learned about that book. Long story short, I used to save all of my money from the guard okay. for 25 years. And I retired as an A uh, 06, a colonel. Wow. So, and did, you know, and that was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I had a good, you know, but it gave me a big nest egg. Didn't okay. know, did not know what God may have me to do with that one day. Yeah. But, and I think that's kind of how that works sometimes. Yeah. But then it came about, it gave me the nest egg I needed to take and do what you see Today. Wow. When you bought this property, was your dad already doing organic practices? No, he was Is... very conventional. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. A lot of when I first started, I kind of did what my dad did because okay. that's what I knew. Whether it's materials and how to build a fence or the tillage, he was the type that I'll call it even anal about if a stick fell out of the tree, he picked it up and put it on a pile. And one day I was out doing the same thing and I noticed there's there's earthworms in this. Earthworms are good. That f earthworm is eating and deteriorating that stick, that limb. I never picked up another one. Lots of freedom there. Wow. You know, Dad always dug all the stumps up and picked every root and stick and all that out there. In fact, as a child growing up, we hated to see that happen because we were the ones doing it, doing all that. <laughs> so when I cleared in 2010 and in 2012, that's what I did. I hired, I, I rented a, a track hoe and I dug all the stumps up and got rid of all that organic matter and just and, and destroyed all the soil structure. What made you realize that maybe you shouldn't do that? Another really good question. In somewhere about 20, 10, 2011, I'd taken some animals, some cows to the stockyard, and 
I had, I remember that I had two, two groups of blacks, steers. They were almost the same weight. They looked identical, you okay. know, color and all, all this. Body condition. Body condition, the whole Finish, bit. everything looked and the same. The, the first one brought like 10 cents a pound more than the second one did. Why? And, and it's like, well, the only thing I could come up with is the guy who bought the first one didn't, wasn't, wasn't in the room to buy the second one. Okay. He went to get a cup of coffee or had to go to the bathroom. Okay. So somebody else bought it because yeah. there was not, not as much competition for it. Okay. And, and I'm thinking, well, how, you know, from my global sourcing, yeah, certified man purchasing manager background, I'm thinking, well, that's a crummy way to try and budget. Yeah, based on the needs of someone else that you yeah. can't even influence. Y you know, so I started looking for a better way. I okay. came across the Stockman Grass Farmer okay. magazine. Yep. I went and visited my wife and I in July of 18, went to Swoop, Virginia, and saw Joel Soliton at the Polyface Farms. He had one of his uh, every other year at the time gatherings, mm -hmm. limited to the first 2,000 people. I can assure you, nobody stayed home. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> showed up. It was $100 of a person. Wow. You know, his vendors paid for everything. His interns did all the work. You know, it was worth every penny. I learned, you know, what I had already read in salad bar beef and pasture poultry profits yep. was exactly what I saw at the farm, which yeah. was refreshing. Uh, from there, I talked, I had a guy come looking for different ways of fertilization. He came and when he left, he called a fellow by the name of John Woods, uh, who has U.S. Wellness Meats up in uh, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Missouri, Illinois, but he has, he winters cows in outside of uh, Mobile and he was down and he called me up and said, Ben, this guy says I need to come by and see your farm. So John and his partner at the time came and we walked around and he looked at what we were doing and he said, I am a, a member of the, have you ever heard of the Grassman, uh, grass fed exchange? I said, nope. He said, well, I'm a member of it, board member. We're having a conference in North Dakota. This was uh, going to be in the summer of 2013 at Gabe Brown's farm. And if you will pay your registration fee, I will use my air miles and pay you for your trip. Wow. So I did. Boy, it, it was like. So it's just like things kind of fell into place. Fell in place. You were just kind of open right to place. the idea yep. of changing yep. and all of these very knowledgeable, influential to, people came you, in. You had to change because yeah. the other way it don't work. And you mean the other way is like selling the, the commodities. The conventional way, yeah. it, it's, a, it's a losing game. My, my grandfather said, never play the other man's game. And when you commodity farm, you're playing the other man's game. Yeah. You're not playing your game. Wow. So how did that change kind of looking back now, realizing the Kind of, it's kind of a big transition to go from commodity farming to, you know, well, pasture farming. Well, fortunately, I really wasn't in the commodity business. So, so it didn't have that big of a financial impact no, on you? No, no impact whatsoever. Okay. You know. So how many, I guess, to put numbers to it, how many cows did you have before? Somewhere around 30. And that's all the livestock that you had? That's it. That's all you were farming? That's, okay. That's all. I mean. We, were you like corn and soybean or hay no, or anything no. else? Well, was, we did. Yeah, we always did our own hay. Okay. But uh, and we don't do that no more. We got rid of that. It's like, because you got them on the grass in the winter. Well, I, not on. Well, you have to have hay. There's no doubt. Of, I don't know how you can do this with not have hay because okay. the weather makes things very unpredictable. Yeah. You know, we went through. I knew it, it was coming because it's been so wet for so many years, and then all of a sudden, the drought this the, summer. The drought this summer and the excessive heat just reversed everything. Yeah. You know, it was. Was, that seems to be something that a lot of people in this area have had a hard time with, and it being so fresh in your minds. Yeah. So you had 30 cows then, you changed over. What do you have now? We have uh, about 65 mama cows. Uh, and when you do grass-fed to grass-finished beef, you will have four generations on the farm at one time. That makes it a little difficult. Yeah. And also you have end up with two herds. That makes it more complicated. So how many bulls do you have? Uh, I have three. Three, okay. Yep. Gotcha. We've been wanting to grow our mama cows, but we are actually selling about 85-ish beef a year. 
Wow. Now. And um, now, is that in so, many capacities, whole halves, live, retail? Uh, it's all uh, it's all direct to consumer. We sell about twenty ish as holes or halves, and the rest would be cut pieces. Retail. Yeah. Wow. But we only have one quote store, okay. retail customer, and uh, I don't want any more. Okay. Uh, that's not who we are. As in wholesale. As in wholesale. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. That's our responsibility is to service our community. Within, within 125 miles of radius of my farm, there is 4.8 million people. Wow. Seven Sons did a uh, class one year. I don't remember the exact number, but it's like 0.01%, I think was what they used to say that these are the folks who would typically buy from a regenerative 0.01% of the local population the local, yeah. would buy from a regenerative farm. Yeah. And buy, you know, fresh from a farm, blah, blah, blah. Which is, for me would be about 4,800 people. Yeah. My farm can only do, if everybody bought what the USDA says per capita spends for average on for chicken and beef and pork, there's no way. Your 90, farm 90, couldn't feed 90, that many people. 95 pounds of chicken a year 94, 95 pounds of chicken a year is what the average per person eats of chicken. In addition to the all the other proteins. 55 pounds of uh, beef or so and 40, uh, 50 pounds of pork a year. You can't produce that. I can't, I can't produce. For, if everybody did that, uh, I would not be able to serve more than about 200 families, 250 families. Can't do it. And you have 500 acres. And I have 500 acres. Now, I, my, I'm not utilizing all of mine to its greatest capacity right now. But you're also probably more like a one-man show? Pretty close. Okay. Pretty close. So we've got labor involved. We've got time involved. We've got land capacity <laughs> involved. We've got extra expenses with feed and buying the chickens. Yeah, but all and, that kind of takes care of itself. Right. You know. But it's still, you know, you know is I an added stress. I think when a farm gets to where there's more than five people involved in the farm, then it's beyond what a farm really ought to be. Okay. It, we, we ought to be duplicating ourselves versus expanding ourselves. It doesn't seem to be a common story that I found so far of farmers who go from conventional to regenerative. Do you get pushback from uh, any like conventional friends nope. or family or anything? Uh, well, one of the things that happens, I think, when you start going down the path that I go down, those folks who disagree with you tend to find, tend to uh, self, they just, they, they avoid you. Oh, okay. You so know, did they, you lose friends then? Oh, I'm, yeah, absolutely. Really? Yeah. Just as people in general, if they find that they disagree with something or maybe don't quite understand something that you're doing, that they just turn you off. Why do you think that is? Well, then they have to they have to talk about you know, or come to grips themselves with is it true or not? And they don't want to be wrong. They don't want to be wrong, and they don't want to change. Yeah. This is the way I've always done it. So how did? Is it just a brain structure you think? Like, how did you just say this is what I've been doing, and now I want to change? Well, like I say, you know, it, it was not as hard for me because I was not deeply involved in the conventional way and That's a good point. I looked at it from a standpoint of dollars and cents you know a lot of people get into it because you know they had a they had a family member or themselves or something like that that was a health issue that they started looking for something different most of our customers we have they came to us because of health concerns their doctor said this or they told them they needed to start eating healthy or you know they had a, a health issue you know, I wish people would think about it from a preventative standpoint instead of just from a, a, a solution. A couple of things that we do to try and help encourage farms here is, you know, providing non-GMO feed. Okay. You know. Why? I, and I, I feel comfortable enough asking feed, you that. Feed is expensive, but the freight is even worse. And okay. nobody is big enough. I mean, we got, we've gotten big enough that we can buy a truckload at a time okay. and use it in a month, month and a half. 
but most of these folks are, are not. Yeah. They're not big enough to do that. So what we do is we, the, if they're local, then they kind of tend to use out of our feed bins. But we've, we've since have kind of migrated this year to where everybody in my area pulls their uh, orders back to me. And then I do the math and kind of build the trucks out for our feed supplier, which is Resaca Sun in uh, Resaca, Georgia, which is northwest Georgia. So you're almost like a mini feed mill for almost people. Almost a mini, well, distributor anyway. Yeah. So we can all together share in a full truckload freight price versus a LTL type freight wow. and get a better price yeah. on our feed, feed cost. Why non-GMO? Well, because it's not been sprayed with glyphosate, number one. Okay. You know. Because GMOs are made to withstand and the glyphosate, the glyphosate yep. for the pest for the, pressure. And whatever your animal eats, you're going to eat the same thing. And Dr. Huber's presentation showed the link between glyphosate, corn, and beans to the animal. Like, you know, the, one of the biggest ones was showing a pig's gut, stomach, one who ate glyphosate feed and another one that did not. The one that ate the glyphosate feed was red and inflamed like it was infected. The one who did not eat glyphosate feed was just as pure and pink and healthy as it could be. So Night and day difference. Why do you think that and people... And if theirs is that way, yours is that way too. So why do you think that people are either don't do non-GMO or aren't unable? Cheap, food, <laughs> expensive, medical. Why would you want to get in your retirement years and spend all your time going back and forth to the doctor. That's okay. stupid. Yeah. I mean, just, and frankly, mine is not that much different in price than it is at the grocery store. And you're, you're able to change your margins a little bit. Absolutely. We're as, not, because you're, you're the, the one-stop shop. You don't have to go through different yeah. distributors. So yeah. you can spend a little bit more on yeah. feed because the non-GMO is more expensive yep. for whatever reason yep. that tends to be that we don't have to get into. So you can change your costs and profits along yep. Yep. as you go. As we go. You yep. have that liberty yep. as the, the one-stop we don't shop. Try and, we don't try and follow what the store prices are yeah. and adjust ours accordingly. Uh, we just look at what our costs are and what kind of margin we need to try and make sure we can survive and stay in business Yeah. Uh, and keep supplying our customers. And that's what it is. You know, You're not trying to be a millionaire. I ain't trying to you be a millionaire. You just want to live you know, comfortably. Uh, uh, have, you know, my biggest goal right now, frankly, is to bring my two boys in to this, that they can take my place. So you do have a succession plan? I do. So are they currently working on the farm with you? Uh, my oldest one is uh, about four days a week. Okay. And my youngest one is about two days. May I ask how old they are? Uh, the oldest uh -oh. one was born in 86 and the other one was born in 92. Okay, okay. <laughs> you figure the math. <laughs> All right. I know the birth dates. Now, how, what that translates, I don't know. This is where you hold See? your grain. So it helps us. It helps there's like seven or eight farms that uh, share the freight mm -hmm. on feed for their farms coming this away That's awesome. every month. So how you've got four bolt containers. How yeah. big are these? They are nine tons a piece. And how much do you alone go through? Uh, it kind of depends on how many hens and how many pigs I've got at the time. Okay, so you've got <laughs> different species in each. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very the two cool. on the ends are hen feed right now. Okay. And this one is our broiler feed. We And we only get, we kind of look at, Okay, I, I actually climb up there and take a physical inventory because, you know, I've got a sheet of paper that tells me that bottom cone will hold so much weight. Okay. And each one of those three rings will hold so much weight. Okay. So I can get a pretty good idea how much feed I've got. Yeah. And I compare it to my uh, QuickBooks inventory. Okay. And I always use the physical versus QuickBooks. I'll adjust QuickBooks to the physical. Uh -huh. And then I know how much I'm using a day. Yeah. So then it tells me how much I need to buy until the next delivery is scheduled. Okay, so you do have to supplement sometimes. Well, the, the pigs and the hens and the broilers get feed every day. Right. The cows, is all forage. Only right. forage. Right, if they If it ain't out there, they don't get it. So in here is compost, Johnson Sioux compost I did. And we're actually using it right now. What did you call it? It's made through, it's made by the Johnson Sioux SU method. You basically are, it's, a, it's at least a year process just for it to, 
David, Dr. David Johnson, who is a professor at New Mexico State University in okay. northwest, northeast Mexico. Uh, he and his wife, his wife is uh, uh, Chinese, one of the Sioux, S oh, okay. SU. So they're kind of in this together, but a lot of his research and what he does at New Mexico State is about composting. There's just tons, tons, tons of uh, videos out there on him wow. and this method and presentations he's made, speeches he's made. You know, we've also, Dr. Elaine Ingram, Ingham, I mentioned earlier. Yeah. My son, oldest son, Eric, he's got a biology degree, so trying to understand the, the microbes and the soil biology and all that kind of fits in his skill set very well. Science was never a strength of mine. Uh -huh. It still is not a strength of mine, and I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> so you are using someone else's method, and what's the quick and dirty of it? Why are we in IBC totes? Why does it take a year? Well, because... One of the things that's really important is it has to uh, cure. Okay. And, you know, it takes time for those microbes to rejuvenate, to grow, to expand. Yep. And the materials that you use and what you feed it and all really make a ton of difference. For example, if you use molasses, sugars and things like that generate a bacteria. Okay. Generate bacteria in your soil is will hold will lock up the nutrients in the soil and make it not available to the plants how about that okay the fungi and the protozoa the protozoa are predator to the bacteria so they will eat the back they're searching for bacteria to eat okay and nematodes as well so it's almost like you have to a, feed the bacteria so that you can feed protozoa no, and get you'll more get, you'll get go plenty of opposite. bacteria okay go the opposite way yeah and you want to you want to do whatever you can to encourage the fungi and the protozoa, because the bacteria is going to be there anyway. Gotcha. And uh, when I did the soil test, that PLFA test, my soil was nine to one bacteria to fungi. Dr. So that's not good. Dr. Ingham will tell you in her 50 plus years of research that a one to one is like your old growth forest that are just very lush and productive. Okay. That's what they are. Okay. One to one. So that's what we are looking to do here is. So you want to strive to one to one. I want to strive for one to one. Okay. And we're doing that by trying to grow a, and improve our soils by growing a highly fungal and protozoa dominant compost that we use an extractor. Okay. Which is what is in that tote up there. Extract that biology out of that. The hard dirt. The, the dirt. The basically. physical dirt. Okay. And then spray it onto our pasture, then let it go to work. The and first time you did that and you saw the results of that, what were your thoughts? Here's where I think a lot of people give up is it's not like going out and putting out uh, 150 pounds of urea on your pasture. So it's not an immediate result. It's not an immediate thing. Dr. Johnson has a video that showed the results. Now, understand he is in New Mexico. It's sandy. It's desert climate. Yeah. He went out and showed the results of, it's a three year research that he did. He first took a shovel and dug down and showed you the composition of what he was planting into. There was very little growth on top of it. It was mostly brown sand composition. Okay. Okay. He planted a diverse cover crop with a no-till drill and sprayed in furrow as he planted. In furrow, what does that mean? Where, the, where he put the seed, where the seed was planted. He sprayed right on top of that. The result was that first year, it was a maybe knee high. That's how much biomass it made. Okay. Not a lot for a whole year. You mean the plant growth the plant was knee growth high? was about knee high. Okay. You know, and so he, you know, as a researcher, he collected all that and weighed right. it and blah, blah, blah. Right. Recorded it. And the next year he came back and he did the same thing. Well, it was like almost waist high. Okay. Second year did the same thing, recorded it, blah, blah, blah. The third year, it was over his head. Wow. So I say that to also introduce a fellow by the name of Corey Miller, okay. who is a farmer in Montana. There's some videos out there on him. He actually has done two presentations with the uh, Soil Food Web, which is free on YouTube. And uh, so if people want to see it, you can Google Soil Food Web. Corey Miller, January 2023. That was his first one. We also will put all the things that you mentioned in the description. Okay. So people will have links okay, to go right cool. there for you. I, talk, I first heard about him 
the fall of last year. Okay. And I called and talked to him. And then I saw that video in January and I saw another one. Well, and in, in, in June, the first week of June. Of this year. Of this year, I called him and he said, Ben, I just completed baling all the hay I need for my farm this year. In his first cut? First cut. Whoa. June, he said, my neighbor's grass hadn't even started growing yet. They're in Montana. Yeah. You know, where they get like 230 days or so below, that's freezing or below uh -huh. a year. Yeah. That's what it was at Bismarck, North Dakota. That's one of the things Gabe Brown said. You know, his growing season is nothing like ours. That's crazy. We're almost opposite. And he, he said, I just finished my second year of using compost extract. So that's what he's seeing. You know, it really, the first year, yeah. The second year, even better. Okay, and it just keeps building on keeps, that. Keep, keeps building. You know, the closer you get it to that one-to-one, -one, the better off you are. Okay, so how long have you been doing it? Uh, we started in the spring. Of this year? When we planted. Okay. Uh, but not everything got it in the spring because I did not have, this wasn't ready. Enough, okay. I did not have enough. But everything that we planted this fall has was sprayed. So you're in the research phase, I'm in, figuring it I'm out. In, I'm within, yeah, I'm still in the first year. Awesome. Now when we have the Soil Health Academy, here in May, I have made one request, and that is I would like Corey Miller, preferably. Mm -hmm. David Johnson would be my second choice because I like to be I here. I want to hear you. from the farmer yeah. that has made this work. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, the research is fine, right. but typically farmers will, entrepreneurial type farmers, are so far ahead of academia. Well, and they, they think differently in standpoint of the way that they observe yep. like i feel like researchers are stuck on looking at everything individually yep. and yep. the farmer's able to take a step back and yep. just see it all as a whole picture yep. and then just with their intuition holistically not holistically in this part in yeah. this part in this part it's all intertwined and if then you they're don't think it ain't intertwined you need to be a farmer you'll learn real quick exa how it is. exactly exactly very intertwined so, so you have other compost then so that's the, just your one that's the one so one of the things that we did too is June of last year, I signed Eric up, my oldest son, biology degree, to take Dr. Elaine Ingham's classes. And on top of that, I wanted to uh, have a consultant come down who's worked under her and with her in the past. So I hired a consultant to come down, the, I think it was like the third week in June. He works with a lot of uh, big farms in the upper Midwest, uh, where they're, most of them are row croppers. Yeah. He's never worked with anybody down this way, but you know, it's the principles are the same. Uh, so this is a different way of making the Johnson Sioux that a lot of people are starting to do. Basically make it inside the ICB tote, where David will tell you, you, you make it inside a, a ring. Oh, and that's what you have these fence. That, 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 rolls here. Yeah. Okay. Then, then you would have like this cloth here on the out, on the inside of it to stop it from falling out. So, <clears throat> so this method is to do it in the IBC tote. Yeah. And then, do you have holes drilled in yeah, here? What's see, that about? You see the pipe holes? Yeah. Well, the reason a bacteria is such a dominant part is it can live in the soil without oxygen. Your fungi and your protozoa have to have oxygen. Uh -huh. That's a very very important part. It does no good or very little good to put a highly fungal compost out and not have and kill it because of compaction. I want to come back to that and I'm going to show you a piece of equipment that we are using to help with that. You have compaction problems? Oh, absolutely. You do? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And when you till and you dig stumps, you will have serious compaction problems because you've destroyed the soil structure. Because those roots are down in there, the keeping it open out. and alive. Exactly. Yeah. You know. Interesting. Organic matter is so, so important. And when you till, you destroy that organic matter. You go and look at, have your people go and Google grass fed exchange, Perry, Georgia, Ray Archuleta, and watch the rainfall simulator part of that presentation. If you don't do anything else, but watch that little bit, the rainfall simulator part, and it shows the difference of how water in, infiltrates soil versus land that's never been tilled, some that's been not been tilled in a long time, mm -hmm. some that's always tilled. Yeah. There's like four different levels. I don't remember what all of them are. Okay, so then you've got different this, compost. This here is actually worm casings. Yep. Ease. It looks nice. Yep. 
from local worms, I may add. <laughs> local worms, all right. And this here is from compost. The consultant helped us make okay. the Lane Ingram way. So you're kind of trying all different applications of compost to figure out well, what works best for good, you guys. The good thing with this is it does not take a year. In 75 days, 90 days, you could use it. Okay. With no problem. So we use the cage as well. This right here. Yep, the cage. And it did not have the cover around it. This is where I've been starting to dump some of my leftovers from when I separate the biology out of it. So we're going to reuse that. Oh, that's a good idea. We got the wood chipper. So we're getting some of our other projects out of the way. And pretty soon, probably between, the holiday, between uh, next week and New Year's, we're going to make a couple more piles. So you're really focused on compost right now. Absolutely. Okay. That's Absolutely. really cool. And we're going to do it, the, mainly going to do it kind of like the Lane Ingram method. Okay. One of the things Corey Miller, I heard him say the other day that he is actually making it based on Elaine Ingham's method. And then he's taking it and putting it in the ICB totes, kind of like the Johnson Sioux method with the pipes and all. To, he's combined. And to let it finish curing until it gets ready to use it. Cool. And that's why we got these holes. Yeah. The holes are there so you can have oxygen down all the way to the bottom of that pile. How do you make those holes? Use uh, uh, just like a bore sewer pipe. Just a sewer pipe. Okay. You, you put them in there, and you got a jig. I put on top of here and, and put them down in there. The the top that used to be here is turned is is upside down in the bottom of here. Okay. So air can come down and come in and down and go all and the way. And so this is open. Yes. And that's, that's why, why you've that's got this here because any water drainage comes out. from moisture because we add moisture. Okay. So any drainage we collect because it's going to have biology. Uh huh. And we pour it back in there. Okay, very cool. Well, Beth and I do all of the order packing. Okay. And we make the deliveries. Okay. Kind of like the quality assurance side of things. Yep. And, okay. you know, we're training the boys on what they need to do. Yeah. I've got a little a little plan I've put together that is about, we're starting as apprentice. Okay. Journeyman, partner, owner. So, and there's did, did, things that they need to be able to they need to rep, they need to get trained on the things from an apprentice standpoint. And once they demonstrate that they can do that, then that'll move up to journeyman. Okay. Okay, bud, you're on your own now. And then over time, they'll become a partner. Where did you learn to know that that was an important part of succession planning? Did you go to someone that would that talk no, about that? Or did you just kind of say, kinda, I think this is a good idea? We, you know, part of it came up through like, in the Air Force with our 623 training records. Okay. And my oldest son spent nine or 10 years, whatever it was, in, in the Guard. Okay. So he knew what a 623 training record was. Okay. And my youngest son is, he's still in, I guess he's probably got 12 or 13 years now. Okay. Wow. So. You think he's going to outrank you? No. <laughs> he's on the enlisted side. Okay. I finished as an uh, officer in 06. Gotcha. So it would, it would be more than a miracle for that to happen. <laughs> now, I would have no problem with that at all. I want both of them to take what we have started and grow and expand it. Okay. And do better. Yeah. I mean, they. I don't want them to make the same mistakes we did. You just want to share your knowledge with the next generation. Absolutely. And That's see awesome. that, the, the, you know, the worst thing that can happen is for this to be shut down. I mean, it would be horrible. Yeah. With as much um, innovation has been happening since you took over the farm. Do you see the same kind of extreme innovation happening <laughs> over the next 30, 50 years that your boys will have to encounter? Uh, yeah, I think there's plenty of room to grow and climb this thing. If you would have asked me even 10 years ago, where will you be in 10 years from now? I'd have had no idea it's been what we're doing. Right yeah. Now. I'd have had no idea. Isn't that kind of the beauty of it though? It is. I mean, one of the guys who started the grass bed exchange, his name was Wayne Rasmussen from Nebraska. And sadly, sadly, when he got to where he could no longer operate his farm, he had to sell his cows mm. because he could not find someone who had the observation skills to go out and do what needed to be done. That probably rings hard on your heart. It does. You know, it would, it would you know, people have told me, even folks who, really didn't care for me or, or my dad or whatever, that he would be very proud of where we've taken this. Oh, wow. And what an... In the family, most of this land was McKenzie family. And that 160 acres actually has a McKenzie 
cemetery on it. Is it really? One of the few McKenzie's that was left at the time told me how much that the, this place has never looked any better than what it looks now. What a compliment. I mean, it's like, yeah, it really is. You know, because, you know, we own a whole bunch now of what was once that family's land. It's kind of like uh, bringing it back together. Well, like that 160 acres had never been sold outside of that family. Wow. But different, you know, the different ones that had inherited it along the way and all that ever happened was uh, cutting pine trees off of it. We worked two years trying to get the rules changed in Mississippi to where they would accept the 20,000. Okay. Uh, our then commissioner of ag, who was Cindy Hyde Smith, she wouldn't even talk to you. She would not, she was, would not even entertain anything that might disrupt Sanderson Farm, who had, it was a billionaire family that owned Sanderson Farms in the state. She wouldn't even think about it. Okay. Uh, our new commissioner who, who was appointed um, helped us out and was, he and uh, Senator Angela Hill, who I was working with even before he came along. I mean, I've made lots of presentations to the Senate Ag Committee and others and stuff like that, trying to get the rules changed. Yeah. But in the fall of 18, I went to a farm in Alabama uh, called Marble City Meats for an American Pasture Poultry Producers okay. little regional get together. Matthew had a USDA poultry plant. And when I saw that, I said, aha, uh -huh, there's the answer. It's not, it's not that elaborate. It's not millions of dollars. So you thought that like you being USDA with the stamp, the certification, All big that. dog, you're like, I can't, I can't do I that. I can't afford that. I yeah. mean, that's way beyond what we could do. But when I saw what he was doing, it's like, yeah. We I can think do I this. can do that. Can so do this. let's see what you did. Let's see what we did. I am so excited. So we back it up to the door here, the trailer. And so the trailer's this away. Okay, right out the door. Yep. And so in the morning, I come in and uh, turn the water up to 160, prep the, get the uh, scalder ready. Wow. And spray the cones down with uh, Pam. Pam, like spray? Pam spray. What? Yep, to help keep the- That's uh, genius. To keep the uh, blood from uh, on the outside from collecting where you can't get them off. Yeah. Okay. So you see, this is homemade. This used to be one of our tables. You just cut it up, welded it just, together? I took it to a place and they had a big folder where they could bend, put this crease and put that crease in it and uh, weld it, put the ends on it. So that became a stainless steel drain for the blood. And we, we collect here and we collect down here. Okay, we're in just into a bucket? Uh, yep, into a bucket. Okay. Yep. We keep it wet, the walls and the floors wet. Why? Uh, just so things, it makes the cleanup easier. Nothing coagulates. Yeah. Okay. Keeps it. Keeps cool. It. So we collect all the feathers. We've got a, a, a lick tub that I've cut and put big holes in to fit under the uh, <laughs> plucker. That is genius. Yep. What a way good. to reuse. A, I never yep. would have thought about using a mineral yep. lick tub. Yeah. That is amazing. Works out really good. Yeah. This is where we bleed. Bleed. Then we use the water. We use this and we'll wash them and get most of the pasture off of them. Okay. And then we scald them. That way your water isn't dirty? It, it stays cleaner, I'll just yeah. put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> it stays yeah, that, I get it. Okay, and then from there, it comes over here and we, we pluck. Yep. And then it goes through the window. Okay. Onto the table. And the rest of it's done on the inside. So, you know, one of the things with the USDA is, you know, you got your dirty side, and the clean side. Okay. I don't go in there. They don't. And if they come out here, they can't go back in there. So the chicken comes in. The person at this station is taking the heads off, the feet off, and we'll start the evisceration and then hang the chicken from the shackle. The, this this station is there doing the evisceration, and the, the inspector has an opportunity to look at the intestines to make sure that chicken is healthy. So you have to have an inspector on site. Yes, the inspector okay. is here. And then uh, this is so if he finds something wrong that we stick the chicken here, supposedly. We've never had that used. What is he looking for They're that looking would be to wrong? see that if the intestines are, are, uh, are the insides are uh, infected and, and stuff like that. Okay. You know, the liver, what's the liver look like? Okay. Things like that. Okay. Everything's good. We make sure that the lungs 
and all and all that inside stuff is out. It all goes down a hole that's right there in this table. Oh, okay. Into is this another custom made table? It is. Uh, Mike Badger with over the Pasture Poultry Group. He has a, a side gig. Has I think he has several side gigs, <laughs> but uh, Mike's a good guy. Yeah. So he he works with uh, Poultry Man. Uh, so that's where this, the the processing equipment out there came from. That's okay. where this came from. Okay. Uh, some Mennonites out of Pennsylvania. Okay. They make them. Yep. Okay. So, you know, we built this and. Uh, we, we started Memorial Day weekend and we did our first live chicken under USDA mid-September of 19. Wow. Three months, four months after we started. Wow. And it, the getting there was harder than doing. Really? It's basically the same as it was when we started. And it, back then, we also used this area to pack orders. Because that was our freezer that we bought about, you know, to uh, along about the same so time. So we walked past that on our we way did. in here. Yeah. Okay. We don't use it as a freezer anymore. We haven't since uh, for about three years now. What do you use it for? It stores lugs and meat crates. Okay. And, okay. Just and, storage. You know, kind of stuff for the plant. Gotcha. The storage area. Okay. Um, so this is clean table. Where's the cut and packaging table? Behind um, it? Or? Behind okay. it over here. Okay. So what happens is once they get down through here and it gets... It, there's uh, QC is going on right here. Quality control. Quality control. And then we use these crate, these uh, dollies and these green crates and we put the chicken in that crate and they stack on top of the dolly. Okay. And once we get about four high, we roll them into our carcass cooler and we air chill. What is that? I have heard that advertised a little bit. What's the big, the big deal with well, air chill? Well, you got two ways. We started out using ice to chill them. Yep. And with that, you basic from a USDA standpoint, you have one hour per four per pound of weight of chicken. So In if ice. chicken weighs four pounds, you have to get it to 40 degrees or less in four hours. Oh, that's a lot of ice. It's a lot of ice. For a chicken that was just alive at 90-something yep. degrees. Yep, absolutely. Wow. So with air chill, you, you have... You're not using any ice, you're not using any water. Mm -hmm. It's basically like putting them in a refrigerator and you have 16 hours. So is there like some kind of bacterial contamination helpfulness there or is it just because it you don't, you're not on a big of a 40 timer? 40 degrees is the magic number. Okay, you just gotta get there kind yeah. of as quick as possible. And, and one of the things, you know, you record temperatures of the animal, like once you, once you get it in there, then your time starts. And Beth is recording throughout the, the evening, afternoon and evening, when does it hit temperature. So gotcha. she, she, you know, we tag one chicken on each crate, each stack of crates. Okay. And so she's checking those and, and recording it. How is she taking that temperature? Is it with a stick probe or yep, just like stick, with an, okay. Probe. So you have to poke a hole in it. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Yep. And this is all for USDA because you Absolutely. weren't doing this when you were That's under correct. the thousand bird That's correct. limit. That is part of the USDA requirement. Okay. Do you. For do my you, HACCP plan. Okay. Do you think that without getting yourself in any trouble, do you think that that adds quality to your birds? Like well, just an extra mindfulness or is it just a government thing? I think it's not a bad thing. I'm thankful that when we were doing it as a thousand, that we never got anybody sick. You know, we. Yeah. we we had some ideas, you know, from a safety, adult, you know, kind of thing to do, but I am a lot more confident in our product today. Now, does that mean that people who, these other, the 40 other states that do it, allow the 20,000, should just say, okay, give them crotch blocks and let them go out and do 20,000 without any kind of training, if you will? Yeah. No. I we should have so. some kind of safety and handling training. Exactly. Okay. And... North, and I know North Carolina is one of the 40 states, and they have a, a website called NC Choices and a, a web pages that, I mean, they do a wonderful job, and it's probably why their ag, annual ag volume or value to their state is about 10, 11 times what it is in Mississippi because they promote small farms and they teach small farms how to do things. A few things that you have to do from a USDA standpoint, a lot of people get hung up on that. You know, one of them is right over here. It's like, why do I have to build a bathroom complete with a shower? Well, you know, because that inspector, when he's here, he may be coming, he may leave this 
as a slaughter plant and go to a ready-to-eat plant next. He's got to have a shower. He can't go from a slaughter plant to a clean plant. That's a good point. He can't do it. Yeah. And you you know never what? know what you might have in your hair you know or... When you're... You got him, people in here working four or five hours, sometimes they got to go to the bathroom. You <laughs> yep, know? Yep, yep. I know about every two hours I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, Absolutely. And we've got customers that come and some of them drive away and they've got kids and their kids need to go, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. And he has to have a place, a desk to work from. A nice, clean, easily accessible place you know, for him to do his little, little work. work. Yeah. And so, you know, it's no big deal. Right. It's, it's actually very handy to have it out here. But a lot of people get hung up over that. Yeah. Just don't touch the beef. I won't touch the beef. Oh, you got beef hanging. I do. Oh, That's man. That's why I said we're cutting beef Tuesday. You are cutting beef on Tuesday, and today is Friday. Yep. Oh, man. Wait, do you dry age? We do. That's awesome. Yep. Look at those beautiful racks. Look at the fat around the brisket. I mean, the uh, filet. Yes. Look at the fat. The back fat. The back this fat. is grass-fed beef. You can see, when you get over here, you can see how yellow. Look at that keratin. And it's got the stamp. Yep. On each yep. quarter. Yep. Wow. Yep. Look at the uh, tallow fat in there. This is grass-fed, grass-finished. Yep. Beautiful looking beef. You see, look at the fat in the brisket that we were talking about. Oh, yes. And see the big hunk of fat around the, 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 uh, the filet. Yeah. So for people that maybe aren't familiar, the ribeyes come from in here, and then the, the filet's tucked underneath, underneath the spine. Yes. The chuck row, this is a chuck here. Yeah. Shoulder uh, right here, the brisket right here. Uh, then your ribeye, then your uh, T-bone or filet and strips. Yep. Sirloin right in here. Then the, the loin tips and rumps and all that stuff in there. Yep. So this is the front of the animal. This is it's the hanging hanger. from the yeah. back. This is the hanger. Ah, uh, there. Okay. Let me tell you a cute story that I think you will appreciate now that you're pro processing your own beef. We didn't know that there was a such thing as a hanger steak until we heard bearded butchers yep. talk about it. Yep. And I called up my processor and I said, hey, what do you do with our hanger steaks? And they said, oh, we just grind them. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> we had those things done every single time. Yeah. That, if you can get a hold of a hanger steak, that is the good. best yep. piece of meat off of a beef. It is the most tender and you only get one per yeah, animal. That's right. Only one. I mean, well, it is amazing. we actually amazing. split it in two. You do split it in we two. Split it two. But as far as a muscle component, yeah. it's just one piece. That's right. And how yeah. long do you dry age for? 14 days. You do a 14 dry age. Yeah. That's awesome. So this will, you know, by uh, Thursday of next week, this room will be empty. Okay. So we'll then come in and you know, all these blood stains and stuff like that, we'll wash it down and it'll be clean. Okay. I can assure you, there's no processing plant that is doing that. Washing their floor? Yeah, that washes. I mean, we'll wash the walls the whole bit. Because you're able to, other processing plants aren't able to just shut down and restart. Right. So you kind of have that, right. that flexibility Freedom. of being yep. on farm yep. that you can just shut her yeah, down, and clean it all. They're, you know, they're, they're working seven, you know, five and six days a week and some of them two, day, two, two shifts. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they always will have something in here. Yeah. But we, we're we not, we we do close it down. That's awesome. So. so you've got five people working here. Is that everybody that you said work? You, your wife, your no, two no, sons no. and? It, the, all of those, me and my wife, and then the other three are off farm. Off farm, they come, okay. They come here, one comes from Loosedale, one comes from Jackson, and another one is a local lady uh, that helps. How, how do you schedule them here? Is it like once a month or <laughs> as needed? How does that work? Very good question. I think one of the keys to what we do and to be successful is we have an annual calendar. On that calendar, I first start with, I mark out the federal holidays. Okay. Because those days, the USDA cannot be here. We always make deliveries the first three weekends. So I know I circle that, I color code it, and okay, so we always pack the Thursday before that. So those days are out. I always, I want to kill beef or slaughter on the first Wednesday of each month. Why is that? Two weeks later, we're cutting and packing, putting it in the freezer for the pe what people can have available to order the next month okay. and be delivered. Okay, so you're kind of like backdating. I'm already, I'm already finished with this month's 
delivery when it goes in the freezer. So my freezer is at its lowest point. Yep. So it's a good time to do a physical inventory if you want to. Yep. Or need to. And then you can uh, go and refill and you're refilling just before it's time for the first group or any of them for the next month to start placing their orders. We, we've learned that you don't want to do beef and chicken in the same week. Why is okay? that? It's a lot of work. Okay, it's, that's what I thought. There, you know, there's just so much of us. Yeah. I use Excel and I say, okay, so we're doing beef, we kill beef here, we're cutting and packing here this week, and we're cutting and packing this week. So our chicken days, weeks are the one between and the one after. I put that in as my slaughter date and use Excel to back to my date I want to receive the chicks. Wow. So then with your beef even, this is kind of where you get into your grass-fed days on pasture, where if you're like, they're not ready, they can just go to my next date so that you're not processing well, a I, beef I've, that's before. I've been doing it long enough to know that I will have some ready by X time. Okay. Okay. To fill that gap, I'm going out to folks I knew through the grass-fed exchange that know what they're doing and that their, their job is mainly to raise beef that they're selling to folks like me. Okay. To other so you try to keep a consistent number of process, animals being processed each processing yeah, absolutely. day? Absolutely. Okay. How many yeah. is that? Uh, seven to eight. Beef. One of the big decisions we have to make is do we work on continuing to increase our mama cows herd where we can do the numbers that we're to supply only from our farm versus uh, going out to the market yeah. and buying finished beef? Or do we do continue with the size herd mama cows we've got now, buy some yearlings, some wieners, mm-hmm. and finish them ourselves? There's pluses and minuses either way. Right. You know, some of the things that go through our mind is, you know, we're very much against the mRNA use in animals, just like we are against the GMO grains okay. fed to animals. Okay. Unbelievably, the, our customer base is the same way because when they started, the news started coming out about chicken has been fed or given mRNA since 2012, pigs for like the last five or six years mm-hmm. now, and they're looking at doing beef. And oh, by the way, if you're getting beef out of Australia, it's been doing, they've been using it for a long time. So they, and they don't want that. And I don't either. We don't, we don't want to eat any of that either. We're on the same, same wavelength. Will you ever be open to um, processing other people's animals no. for them? No, nope. we, Quick we are no. not into the business of doing this commercially or, you know, there's other folks out there that can do this for you, for them. You know, Would you be open to sharing absolutely. how you've done it to help other we, people get it on have, theirs? On the chicken side, we probably have helped 10 or 15 people as far away as Maine Awesome. do this. Very cool. You know, from our HACCP to our plans and the whole shooting match. Awesome. Absolutely. It's part of that. We can't do it all. We don't intend to be big enough to do it all. We ain't no tent to it. We are not going to be big enough to do uh-huh. it all. We are more interested in duplicating what we're doing helping other people duplicate what we're doing for their self and for their families and have their own farm. Absolutely. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, but I just want to say thank you You're so much welcome. for letting me come out here and I see opportunities to come back if you'll have me. What you're doing here, just from a farmer standpoint, is amazing, but from a end of product consumer initiative standpoint, I think is just going the extra mile. Well, the extra mile includes you know, those animals having a really great life out on pasture where they were intended to be yeah. and regenerating the soil and the process of what they do every day. And they have one bad day. Yeah. One bad, I mean, not even a day. Yeah. And I'm sure that they're more calm because oh, yeah. you're not, Ab- absolutely. you're not taking them to a foreign place. They know where they're at. They know you. They're not being unloaded into a pen with cows from other farms yep. or other places of a stockyard, you know, and it's just a whole lot of, that's awesome. whole lot's better, whole, whole lot's better. Before we go, if there's anybody in your area and they want to meet you, buy your product, um, get to know a little bit more about you, how do they do that? The best way is uh, using our website, okay. naturesgourmetfarm.com. Okay. And 
And that link will be in the description below. Everything that you've seen and heard today is also on our website, either directly on our product pages or in our blog that goes back years and years and years, okay. like 2016. Wow. We were like in the top five or six, I think, that started with, with Seven Sons Grace Cart. It's come a long way. We're certainly not as big as what a lot of them are since then. Yeah. But I don't intend to be. Okay. I'm not going to be a white oak pastures with over 100 employees and 33,000 acres. And, you know, I, I think it ought, ought to be local, community, small reach. Absolutely. Thank let's, you, Ben. Let's duplicate. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it again. Like.